Testing, testing. All right, guys, if we can start sitting down, we'll start, we'll start lecture. All right, so here to walk us through um, everything surgery related in terms of consults um, is Daniel Hubbs, is one of our surgery residents, and he's gonna be here to guide us through um, general surgery consults and how to approach them. So thank you very much, Daniel. Excellent. Can everybody hear me? Okay, good. When I got the email about this, one of the things they said is the goal is not just to be a lecture, which I totally agree with. Uh, so we'll try to be as interactive as possible with people eating and, of course, with people not wanting to talk or be interactive, but we will do our best. <laughs> um, so yeah, my name is Daniel Hubs. I'm one of the fifth year general surgery residents here at Loyola. Um, we've probably interacted at some point uh, when you guys are in the ICU or on the floor or something. Um, I just kind of, you know, was invited to give a quick talk, kind of talking about some common general surgery consults, kind of, I think, more the mentality and the thought process to address it and then run through some cases. Uh, I am by not means, you know, the expert on everything and uh, very humble to say I'm often wrong, but I uh, hope to give you guys kind of a, you know, a thought process of how to approach this and some of the common things we deal with. We'll leave a little time for questions and stuff at the end. Um, so like we said, goal kind of talk about some general surgery consults, the pre-consult phase, uh, important things to convey, and then talk about some cases. Uh, big fan on Twitter of Dr. Glomaflecken and all of his uh, TikToks, all of the rage. Um, so this is his surgery character who I will be doing my best to channel throughout our presentation today. Um, so a few of the things, you know, I'll talk a little bit about practical, like, applicable things for your actual residency here at Loyola, kind of how some of the things work here. Um, they don't necessarily make sense, but that's the system we've inherited. Um, and then kind of just some cases like we had talked about. So one of the very practical things um, is kind of the way that our consults and coverage works here is 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Basically, every service has their own pager and covers their own consults, um, except for 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. and weekends after 10 a.m., which I understand is not the most intuitive. Um, but during the day, you can always just page or curator or AMS connect uh, the specific surgery team that you're trying to get a hold of. Uh, and then on nights or on weekends, uh, this is the pager, which is kind of hidden away on care everywhere under the general surgery tab. It's this acute care surgery intermediate pager. And then only in the red does it really tell you that this is for all surgery consults for nights and weekends. Um, so I think there's a lot of confusion about that in general for weekends. Um, and that is the system we've inherited and we've tried to update web on call and stuff, but uh, no easy fixes there. One of the things too is, you know, uh, we have basically one consult resident. So they're admitting patients, they're operating, they're helping out in traumas. Um, as a general rule, we say that if we're called, we'll see that patient. Um, so anyone who's called overnight will be seen by that night resident. It's not something that they can pass off till the morning. Uh, so with that, they're obviously juggling a lot. Um, and any non-urgent consults, you know, trach pegs that we're gonna get called during the day, then, then thoughts, oh, caught it overnight. Um, when possible, you know, I think that's nice if those can be called during the day when we have the full cohort here. Um, but at the end of the day, if you're not sure if something's urgent, it's the whole reason we're here. So always happy to get a call. And when in doubt, you know, just always give a call. Uh, this kind of on that, another one of his great TikToks here, you know, the perfect surgery consult. You know, you can't call surgery too early or they won't need a surgery and surgery will be upset. And you can't call them too late because then the patient's gonna die and then surgery's gonna be upset. Uh, so it is definitely, a, I feel like a lot of things in residency and medical school is like, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't, and you just have to pick which one. I think in general, uh, most people here have probably taken step three. There's a portion on there with the cases and the way that I really think about consults in general, when I'm calling consults and everything else is just 
you're usually trying to already be at a diagnosis or something and then consulting someone for the specific management or clinical question uh, or the ever popular because the attending made me, which is in my opinion, totally okay. Our attendings do it sometimes, your attendings do it sometimes. As long as for those, we're all chill about it. I think that's a totally reasonable uh, consult. A few of the specific considerations, you know, I think things that are good to pick up on whenever you're going to call a surgery consult. Um, one of the big things we always ask about is the NPO status. Uh, I remember when I was a fourth year medical student on my emergency medicine rotation, I called an ortho consult for this patient. They said, well, when they eat the last, and I was like, oh, I don't know. And I got like reamed out as a medical student by this ortho uh, resident about like, well, I guess I don't know if I can do anything for him. I don't know when I can do anything for him. Uh, it'd be really nice to know that, but it's too bad we don't know. And uh, I took that as feedback. You know, that was like, mm, that would be a good thing for me to remember. Uh, and though I don't think that's the best way for me to teach people, um, I think that is something that, you know, really stuck with me as knowing their NPO status is really important for a couple of reasons. You know, if it's an emergency surgery, it kind of doesn't matter. Uh, we'll take them. We have to do what we have to do. Um, but for things that aren't, you know, super emergent, um, then we do try to do what's kind of safest for them with regards to an aspiration risk. So usually for clears, that means waiting at least two hours. Uh, for pediatric patients, they've had breast milk four hours. Light mill, those people who are just snacking on a little toast, uh, ate a little taco on their way to the emergency department. <laughs> Unfortunately, the people who make it through Portillo's on the way to the emergency department are usually kind of even further back. Um, and that kind of just all goes to when we call the OR and say, we'd like to add this case on uh, where we can actually kind of get them on if it's gonna be that day or if really uh, it'll be a next day affair. Another thing is blood thinners. Uh, blood makes things like kind of hard to work with. Um, so when we can kind of minimize that, uh, again, kind of the thing of if it's an emergency, you have to do things. Um, but knowing their blood thinner status can also help a lot for our preoperative planning. Um, so for more elective things, um, we like to hold those if we can. So some cases that are elective, urgent, but not emergent, uh, if we can stabilize those, sometimes we will even wait a couple days to try to give them the best chance of not having a bleeding complication. Um, I think in older school, there was a bigger concern for DVT prophylaxis. I think even when I was an intern, some of our services, some of the orthopedic surgery services um, wouldn't operate on people or would delay the case if they had got DVT prophylaxis the night before. I think most of the orthopedics programs and just about all of the surgery programs now are perfectly fine operating uh, on heparin, you know, at a DVT prophylaxis level. Uh, most of our patients now coming in electively even get a shot of heparin in PACU before the case because the thrombotic risk is so high in the setting of the immobility, inflammation from surgery. Um, so that's kind of the way where I think even in the five years that I've been here, I've seen that push from hold DVT at midnight to now, you know, we're giving them a shot in PACU. So medicine. Uh, aspirin, you know, usually that's okay to proceed with surgery. There's some very rare cases, sometimes some head and neck procedures where they're kind of concerned about every drop of blood that they would ask. But in general, if someone's on uh, baby aspirin, that won't uh, preclude any interventions. Heparin drip, you know, due to the half-life, uh, usually say about six hours. Again, with some vascular procedures, they'll just stop that on the way rolling down. But usually a heparin drip, uh, if we're looking at like a 7 a.m. start, well, you know, we'll usually say five o'clock or I mean, two o'clock or so stop that. And by the time we get into OR, we're all settled out. Your direct actings, you know, we usually say about two days for that. Uh, our antiplatelet agents, usually five to seven days. Um, and then Coumadin for our patients with AFib and stuff like that is usually dependent on the patient's actually embolic risk. So I know you guys probably on cardiac uh, deal with a lot of patients with heart valves, high CHADS VAS scores. Uh, and kind of a discussion always comes up with that of if this is a patient that needs to be admitted, bridged on a heparin drip, you know, can they be bridged with Lovenox as an outpatient? Um, and kind of what do we need to do to get them in safely from a embolic risk, but also from a bleeding risk for the surgery? So that's usually a discussion that's had as an outpatient, you know, with the, your cardiologist or your primary care doctor who sometimes is managing uh, their blood thinning medications.
if you guys have questions at any point, feel free to jump in. I know this is like, I made this thing when I was studying for our in-service a couple of years ago and still always like pull that up in clinic. I'm like, okay, yeah, five days, right? Okay, perfect. Um, but if you guys have any questions, concerns, I'm not intimidating, so you can interrupt me. It'll be totally cool. Uh, other thing is if they're interested in surgery, I think there is the good general principle that for uh, any proceduralist, it's probably best that the person who's doing the procedure really discuss that with them. Um, I think the small exception for those are things where we're really more technicians. So for trachs and pegs, that's usually more of a goals of care discussion than a surgical discussion. Um, we're of course happy to help with those, but in that role, we're usually functioning more as a technician um, than a surgeon who's gonna be involved in their long-term care. Um, I've been called many a time to come see a patient for a trach and a peg, showed up at the bedside and the family yelled at me and reamed at me for, we told them we didn't want this, we would never do this, why are you here? And we're like, oh, it's fine. <laughs> Uh, so I think in some of those cases, you know, trach pegs is always good that the, you know, family making sure that they're on board, that it is something that they're interested in. You know, we can have that conversation about the risks and benefits of surgery, uh, but I think the conversation about their goals of care um, and kind of ultimate um, what would be in line with what they'd want is kind of best had by the team that has the most intimate relationship with them. Another thing that can be helpful is for patients who uh, have complex social situations, who may have power of attorneys, uh, conflicting family. Um, you know, sometimes it's hard as a team coming into a complicated social situation that if you see the wife at the bedside, you talk to the wife, you can send the wife, but then you find out they're estranged. It's actually the brother in Utah who has POA and we consented the wrong person. And now, you know, um, so when there are complex social situations, um, which I feel like comically happens more in the hospital than I thought, um, it is definitely nice to have a heads up on that. Jehovah's Witness, I'm on colorectal surgery currently. One of our attendings, Dr. Singer, is like a preferred provider for the Jehovah's Witness community. Um, so we have almost always, including right now, a Jehovah's Witness with a GI bleed in the hospital. Um, and in patients who do have specific uh, beliefs, um, contraindications to getting blood products, you know, that's something that's obviously good to know up front because we can make accommodations and plan for those. Um, but the earlier we know about that and kind of know what our options are, the better. Then obviously all the exciting uh, COVID related things, you know, if there's some airborne maladies, you know, uh, I've done trachs, pegs, appies on people with COVID this last couple of years. Them having COVID is not a contraindication to having surgery, but in some cases where things can be managed non-operatively, um, it is definitely a consideration for that patient uh, if we want to intubate them, put them through general anesthesia or try to treat them medically. Um, so I think that's, you know, just part of that whole specific perioperative discussion that's worth having with the primary team and the operating team. Uh, acuity, you know, like I said, we're usually either in the clinic, in the OR, um, rarely do I have the pleasure like today where I'm just kind of hanging out. Um, so we're usually having to do something else and being able to really convey the acuity of this is a sick patient I'm worried about, I want you to come see them versus you know, this is someone when you guys finish rounds, finish clinic, you know, swing by and talk to them. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, we've all dropped what we've had to do, go see a sick patient. Um, but we don't want to, you know, drop what we're doing, make people wait in clinic to go see someone who we could have seen at the end of clinic as well. Then the last thing, uh, if they're pregnant, you know, most people who are coming through the ED have already kind of got a pregnancy test. Um, but it's not uncommon that, you know, for that preoperative uh, workup, that were then all of a sudden delayed because we forgot to order a pregnancy test, forgot to ask people um, to get that going. So I think that's just another consideration. I think that's the last for my specific considerations. Any questions, concerns, thoughts there? I'll allow an appropriate amount of awkward silence before moving on. Excellent. Um, so then specifically with some cases. So I just have some cases here um, that we'll run through um, really more kind of of the thought process of um, how I think about it from a surgical side. 
This is more as a resident to a resident, a, learn, a trainee to a trainee. This is not your textbook, 100% of everything you need in here, but I think this is a good kind of framework and thought process to approach it. Uh, this is, you know, the slide out of UWorld after that pop-up that said, please do not copy and paste our slides. Um, but it's a nice slide. Um, <laughs> I think in general, you know, a lot of the surgery consults end up being for things like abdominal pain, uh, wounds, kind of these weird physical problems. Um, but I think the thing that we end up getting consulted about the most is the belly. So our case one, this is Mr. Sanders. He's a 61 year old gentleman, loves fried chicken, ate a ton of it, uh, did not feel well afterwards. He's personal friends with the CEO here at Loyola. They brought him straight in directly onto a lovely medicine team, treatment of human spirit, some observation, get them all tuned up. Uh, he did not want to wait downstairs, so he got, you know, straight to Four Tower, you know, a nice private room. It's very luxurious. But now he's feeling kind of crummy, feeling nauseous. He threw up once, uh, but overall, you know, just doesn't feel well. What should we do? Everyone has just walked into this patient's room and is staring at him silently. <laughs> Yes, so he looks like this. He's sitting there, he's not actually yellow, but he's just a little upset. Uh, he threw up outside, you know, he doesn't know. He doesn't really wanna talk about his vomit. Yes, excellent. So I think what everyone's getting to is, I would start with a thorough history and physical exam. Um, I don't know how you got how your boards necessarily work, but as part of surgery, we have a written board and then an oral board. And almost comically for every one of those scenarios starts off with your chief complaint followed with, then I would start with a thorough history and physical exam. So perfect. So he's a 61 year, one year old gentleman. He's had this abdominal pain a couple of times. Seems like it's uh, in the abdomen feels a little nauseous, usually goes after a couple wait, a couple hours. Right now that he's settled in, he's talked with the nurses, he's not really feeling it a whole lot anymore. No real significant past medical or surgical history. He's afebrile, normal vitals. On exam, you know, he's alert, oriented, cooperative, looks pretty comfortable. Uh, when you really press on his belly, he's kind of minimally tender in the epigastric area, the right upper quadrant, but not really complaining of too much. So what are your thoughts? So I always think after we have seen them, we get our brief history and physical, then the next step is usually coming up kind of with our differential, and then we'll base our tests and interventions and stuff based on that. So with this kind of combination of signs and symptoms, what are you thinking in terms of our differential? Sure, bowel obstruction, Cholelithiasis, pancreatitis, love it. GERD, yep. Yes, but I think we agree, kind of some intra-abdominal stuff, doesn't seem the worst, but something weird going on. So yeah, maybe some gastroenteritis, maybe the chicken he had was actually bad chicken. Uh, acute cholecystitis, I know we said cholelithiasis, I mean, that's just, you know, stones of the gallbladder, but kind of what are the problems related with those? Um, so it could be biliary colic, acute cholecystitis, cholelithiasis, pancreatitis, GERD, you know, all those things. So what do we want to do for this guy? What would our workup be? Yeah, like it. So some uh, ultrasound, anything else? Yeah, like it, some labs. So CBC, CB, BMP, LFT is pretty normal. Um, his right upper quadrant ultrasound does show some stones, but no thickening, no pericholocystic fluid, negative ultrasound, um, you know, pretty unremarkable. What are our thoughts? We got all this back. We're walking back to his room. We're about to chat with him. We have our differential from before. 
now we can kind of refine it some. What do we think? Yeah, so I mean, it seems gallbladder related. We know he has stones. Uh, his LFTs being normal is kind of reassuring. Um, so I agree. I think I'd head down that uh, biliary colic, symptomatic um, stones. You know, there definitely could be other things, right? This could just be gastroenteritis, acute cholecystitis, but probably less likely. Um, so in this case, with a patient who comes in, you know, it's pretty subclinical. At this point, the pain has kind of gone away. Uh, you're thinking biliary colic. Uh, what do you guys think about a consult? And I will say this is not a black and white one for sure. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I agree. You know, um, I think this is one where I imagine there's a lot of these that do just go straight home that we never get called about. Um, we get called about these sometimes. Um, and I think either way is reasonable. You know, in a patient who um, there's really nothing else going on, you feel really confident in your diagnosis, um, I think totally fine to discharge the patient and have them follow up uh, as an outpatient for further evaluation. I think it's not always black and white. You know, sometimes they do still feel a little uncomfortable. They're still kind of nauseous. Um, so this is not an uncommon surgery consult. Uh, and I think it's totally appropriate that, you know, if there's any question, uh, surgery can always come take a look. If it is truly biliary colic, that pain usually goes away after six, eight, 10 hours. They're pretty asymptomatic. They're feeling hungry. Uh, those are usually safe to go. Uh, just knowing that it may happen again, they may need to come back if it happens again. Uh, rarely are these done on the same admission, um, but in special circumstances, people who've had this multiple times before, it keeps happening, it's happened again, they really want to get it done. Uh, sometimes we are able to get these done at the same time. So I don't know if you guys have seen Loki, but you can think of this as another variant. So same patient, different timeline, 61-year-old guy, now Again, in the hospital, abdominal pain, nausea, emesis. What do we want to do? Love it. <laughs> um, so this time, this guy you know, has some abdominal pain. He's thrown up. He's been having this pain a couple times a year. It usually goes after, away after a few hours, but this time it's been like over 12 hours. He still feels crummy. He called the CEO. The CEO said, no waiting in the ED for you. Come to the hospital, we'll get this sorted out. Still no significant past medical surgical history. His vitals, you know, borderline tachycardia, but overall looks okay. Uh, maybe barely a fever, 38.5. Um, in surgery, we usually raise what we call a surgical fever so that we can ignore more fevers. Uh, so we usually say 38.5 is a surgical fever which is like 101.3 if you're into the other system. Um, but you know, on exam, he looks uncomfortable. He is tender in the right upper quadrant. He has a positive Murphy's sign. Uh, so kind of all of the buzzwords towards something more nefarious. What do we think about this guy? Sure, so acute cholecystitis, anything else? Yeah, Coley Doco. Yeah, I think in general, you have that kind of abdominal pain, right upper quadrant. There's kind of a little group of stuff that all runs together there. So could still be gastroenteritis, really bad chicken, you know, but probably acute cholecystitis is starting to work, uh, kind of be in there. Thoughts in terms of workup? Yes, love it. Labs and ultrasound. Uh, so this guy, this time, you know, has a little bit of a white count, has a little AKI. He says he hasn't been able to keep any fluids down. He's been throwing up a uh, little bump in his LFTs. The bilirubin's normal. The ultrasound does show stones. It shows some thickening, some pericholecystic fluid, no um, common bile duct dilation. What do you think? Well, Yeah, so kind of more classical picture of acute cholecystitis. You know, if you have all the things, fever, right upper quadrant pain, and ultrasound, white count, 
You know, these are the nice slam dunks that are uh, not as common as you would hope. Um, so this is, you know, a good surgical consult, um, kind of keeping all those other things in mind. You know, most of our patients are not that healthy here at Loyola, um, but a nice straightforward patient like this, no significant past medical surgical history is someone who can likely go get a uh, lap coli after their eight hours when their chicken has worn off. Case three, same guy, still in the hospital. What do we want to do? Love it. Oh. Yes. So this guy now, um, you know, some mild abdominal discomfort, normal vitals, pretty reassuring ab abdominal exam. He is a little uncomfortable in the right upper quadrant, but negative Murphy's. Uh, what do you guys think for this one? Differentials. Yeah. It's kind of that same pool of right upper quadrant differentials. I know it's kind of uh, very repetitive. I'm a big believer in repetition. Um, so I think it's that same kind of deal, right? Gastritis, bad chicken, biliary colic, you know, who knows? Still pretty vague when you just have abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. So then I think the labs are really helpful here. So has a little bit of a white count, little bump in his creatinine again, AST, ALT, a little wonky. But then we see we have a bump in his bilirubin, his ultrasound shows stones, common bile duct dilation, um, but no thickening or fluid around the gallbladder. What do we think here? Yeah, so I think exactly, thinking more cholidocolithiasis, uh, this is a patient who would benefit from GI to clear that obstruction. You know, that's kind of the urgent cause. Uh, right now, it doesn't seem like he has anything worse, ascending cholangitis or anything like that. Um, but you want to get that ERCP done, clear the duct. Uh, and then as soon as things are headed the right direction, as a surgery team, we'll usually try to offer these people uh, surgery that same admission. Is there a chance of having another biliary complication, be it cholidocolithiasis, uh, gallstone, pancreatitis, things like that are actually pretty high within a four week period afterwards. Case four, this time worse abdominal pain. You see him and the nurses say, he just got up here, but I'm kind of concerned. I think I might call it rapid. He feels really bad. He looks really crummy. What do you want to do? Yes, love it. <laughs> um, so in this case, you know, he's kind of has some altered mental status. He's a little hypotensive, tachycardic. He's febrile. This guy is actually kind of a little yellow and he is endorsing some right upper quadrant pain. Thoughts on this guy? Yeah, so there is a name for this thing when we start adding, there's five bolded points here. And it is probably one of these like old white dudes, which we're trying to get away from. Yeah, so Reynolds Pintad. So fever, jaundice, right upper quadrant pain, shock, altered mental status. Um, that kind of patient where you are worried, they are headed the wrong direction. You want to intervene quickly. So what do we want to do to intervene? Yep, love it, stabilize. Yeah, so how are we gonna get source control for ascending cholangitis? Right, so our source control will come through clearing that duct, letting the pus drain out, decompressing the biliary system. Um, in this case, kind of similar, you have the clinical, high clinical suspicion. You still wanna confirm it, make sure there's no other more nefarious uh, other things going on. Um, quick labs, you know, you see an elevated white count, elevated bilirubin, common bile duct dilation. Um, this is normally where, when there is concern for stones and stuff in the bile duct, um, kind of what is the etiology that you wanna to use to image that varies a little bit. So taking a little step outside of this patient was gonna talk briefly. There's ultrasound, CT and MRCP. Yeah, or MRCP, yeah. Um, 
generally, you know, an ultrasound is a really good test, probably one of the most sensitive there for actually seeing stones, seeing the dilation. Um, when a patient's actually, you know, sick and it's not a slam dunk, you want to make sure you're not missing some other intra-abdominal catastrophe. A lot of times those are patients who we will want to go ahead and get a CT on. Um, and MRCP tends to be a decision with uh, GI. You know, from our perspective, we're like, something looks like it's in the duct. Get those GI guys, MRCP, you know, uh, ERCP, scope it up, fix it. Um, but obviously, an ERCP is not without risk. So in some patients that are not totally clear cut, uh, they will want to get a uh, MRI first before they would do an invasive procedure. So yeah, for this guy, uh, acute cholangitis. Um, Fluids, antibiotics, GI for the ERCP and source control, and similar to our other patient, um, you know, as long as they settle out, we want to do that lap coli, the same admission to prevent them from having another episode of this in the future. Okay, case five, different person. Miss Betty, she's a 73-year-old. Again, abdominal pain, altered mental status, feels really crummy. Uh, she is on the floor. Nurses, again, are about to call a rapid. You just took over, first day on service. Don't remember sign out. What do we want to do? She feels bad. She's, she needs help. Yes, same as everyone. <laughs> Start with a history, physical exam. So for her, you know, she's 73 years old. She's active in the silver sneakers. Uh, she's been having some worsening abdominal pain, starting to feel a little fever, chills, past medical history of, you know, arthritis, takes a ton of ibuprofen. Um, but with that, you know, she's at the top of her class. She's very proud of that, pretty active. Uh, but now as the nurses are checking, you know, she's hypotensive, tachycardic, febrile, a little confused. Uh, when you feel her belly, you know, it just feels more firm. She's screaming at you whenever you're bumping the table feeling her belly, what are our thoughts? Yeah, so peritonitis, you know, I think there's a lot of, it's kind of a, a general term that you hear a lot, you know, peritonitis just meaning inflammation of the peritoneal cavity, um, usually a sign of something nefarious going on inside of the belly, um, but those always uh, kind of are a good way to like make people both get really anxious and roll their eyes at the same time. Uh, when a resident tells me that, I, you know, one of our junior residents, consort residents, I both roll my eyes and get very anxious at the same time <laughs> uh, because either it's, you know, actually going to be okay or uh, it's usually very, very bad things are on the horizon. So what is on our differential? We're hypotensive, we're in shock, we have a peritoneal abdominal exam. What could be doing this? Yeah, so perforation. Yeah, it's nice when the story lines up, especially like good like step, like, oh yeah, yeah. They're pounding a ton of NSAIDs. You're like, perfect, ideal. Um, but really still could be a lot of things, right? We have a bad abdominal exam and hypotension. Um, could be pancreatitis, bad diverticulitis, you know, could be urosepsis could have a perforated gastric ulcer, could be cholangitis, mesenteric ischemia. There's still a lot of things that we don't know. Uh, so in terms of this workup, what would you guys think in terms of our first steps? Yep, so some fluid resuscitation. And this is kind of always that thing where in real life, you know, multiple things are happening at once. So sure, you can call surgery. Other thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, all the things, like you said, kind of happen at the same time, right? So you're gonna get fluids, you're gonna make sure you have IV access, you're gonna send off labs. One of the faster studies you can get done is a uh, upright. So you see that she has an elevated white count, an AKI, has a lactate of like six, uh, and then here on this x-ray, you get an upright x-ray, and you see that she has subdiaphragmatic free air. So kind of here we can see the nice smooth dome of the liver, the diaphragm, and all this clear here. What are our thoughts now? Yes, but what, do we, what are we going to tell them? What do we think is the problem? 
So the air got there from somewhere, right? Uh, so the concern is we don't know where, uh, could be our nice story lining up with a bunch of ibuprofen, now has a perforated gastric ulcer. But with all that air, we suspect there's at least perforated hollow viscous somewhere. Um, and the best way to find that will be surgery. You know, that's unfortunately someone where usually they are looking at uh, a big exploratory laparotomy. Um, but like we said, the first things to going to during that simultaneously fluid, antibiotics, uh, talking with surgery. I mean, I've had almost this exact consult um, where, you know, someone says, hey, they look really bad. I just got a plain film, labs are cooking. Uh, and we look at the plain film and we take them straight from there. Uh, I love CT scans. Love it. Never disappoint if there's a CT scan, uh, but we don't need CT scans for everybody. Um, there are cases where the clinical picture uh, kind of points you in that direction. Okay, another variant. 73-year-old now with left lower quadrant pain. She's looking all right. What do we want to do? Love it. <laughs> Um, so 73 year old, she's had two days of cramping pain. Um, otherwise pretty minor medical surgical history, uh, stable, uh, the surgeons, you know, you know, they're going to say she doesn't have a fever, uh, 38.4. She does look a little uncomfortable though. She's having some left lower quadrant pain. She's kind of focally tender. Uh, you don't know if you should call it peritoneal. You don't want someone to roll their eyes at you. Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so um, clinically sounds like a good, good uh, setup for diverticulitis. Maybe she has, you know, a very late ectopic pregnancy. It's possible. Uh, pancreatitis, you know, in older patients, we think about like sigmoid volvulus. This could be just really bad constipation. Uh, I don't know. It's on a medicine service, lupus. So what do we want to do for our workup? Yeah, so again, this is a gray area, right? So um, a lot of diverticulitis is diagnosed clinically and managed totally as an outpatient. Uh, in a patient who is in the hospital in the emergency room or the inpatient setting, I think uh, most people would proceed with a CT scan. Uh, kind of a sidebar from her here, um, on a CT scan, that's usually what we, that's kind of the test of choice that really guides further management on the inpatient side. Um, because the CT scan is going to show some bowel wall thickening, some pericolonic inflammation, and then really helps us divide them into the two camps of the uncomplicated or the complicated. Um, let's say that Miss Betty here is the uncomplicated route. She has this CT here that just shows some inflammation, um, you know, nothing else too nefarious going on. She looks relatively stable. Um, this is a patient who can likely uh, just be managed either outpatient or OBS briefly to make sure she's headed in the right direction and then discharged. Uh, but almost any patient that has complicated diverticulitis uh, will need some type of intervention. So for our patients with complicated diverticulitis usually breaks down into one of these four categories. So they'll usually either have diverticulitis with a frank perforation. This is where like that other x-ray, you could just see a bunch of free air. Um, what do we think are so for uncomplicated, I would say in terms of our consults, again, can kind of go either way. Um, kind of like biliary colic is usually more culture of the program. You know, is this someone that you're giving surgery a heads up about? You just want them to follow up as an outpatient uh, or is this someone who you're actually calling them on? For complicated is usually pretty straightforward. Most of these patients should probably be on a surgical service uh, and that's due to the interventions. Uh, for frank perforation interventions, you know, they're likely going to get an operation. For an abscess, they're going to get a drain. Um, if the drain doesn't improve, they'll then get an operation. Uh, for obstruction, you always worry about that being a malignancy that actually caused the small perforation than the diverticulitis-like picture. Uh, so a lot of times patients with obstruction, if we can't get them through it, they will also require an operation. Uh, or a fistulization where there is a fistula between the diverticulitis, the bladder, uh, the vagina, um, any of those can usually be settled out medically, but need follow-up because they are also likely looking at an operation. 
So for those, um, these patients, you know, with diverticulitis, I think a lot of these also are just managed in the community, never make it into the hospital. Uh, but especially for the patients that are complicated, these are people who do benefit from a surgical consult, possibly operative. Uh, but afterwards, you know, they should get a scope in a couple weeks, make sure that there wasn't actually cancer or some mass, uh, and then offer the discussion of an elective surgery to prevent future episodes. I think in the past, that was a little more cut and dry. They came up with these criteria. If you're X age with X many episodes, then we recommend it. If you're X age with these few, we don't. Uh, now, almost all of that discussion has leaned towards uh, the patient's preference. So even young, relatively healthy patients with one episode who say they're going to be doing mission work somewhere remote, they don't want the chance of this happening again. Uh, in those patients, you know, we still would offer them that if that's something that they would want. Uh, previously, it was thought that your first episode was the least and it got worse from there, uh, but it's really been shown since then that usually every subsequent episode is about the same. Your chance of having an upper episode after the first one is about 50%, after the second one is still about 50%, after the third still about 50%. Uh, so it really comes down to a personal decision with the patient. Uh, is this something that's bugging them all the time that they just want to be done with, or even with a couple episodes if they're really against surgery? Uh, that's not a totally unreasonable option. And I think this is our final case. Back to Mrs. Mr. Sanders. He again here, abdominal pain, nausea, and emesis. What do we want to do? Yes, love it. Um, so, you know, he reports he had sudden abdominal pain, nausea, emesis, hasn't been passing any gas, no poop. Uh, since yesterday, he's feeling bloated. You know, he got in a knife fight when he was trying to open his chicken joint a couple of years ago, had to get a trauma X lab. He got a splenectomy. You know, he has his normal old male bilateral hernias. Um, but otherwise, you know, his pressures are okay. He's not tacky, uh, but not, you know, looking the great, greatest. He's uncomfortable, but alert, oriented, cooperative. On exam, he's kind of diffusely distended. You do feel this weird midline mass that's a little tender. He swats your hand away and says, do you know who I am when you touch him? Uh, what would you do next? Thoughts in terms of differential? Why is he having pain? Sure, so some type of bowel obstruction, right? So bowel obstruction could be from a hernia, Maybe it's still that bad chicken. You know, I don't think we can rule it out. Um, so what's our workup gonna be? Sorry? Sure, so a KUB is definitely an option. Other thoughts? Abdominal ultrasound. What would you be looking for with the abdominal ultrasound? Are you saying like a right upper quadrant gallbladder ultrasound? Yeah, so I think it's helpful to have some imaging. Um, also, I think in this case, when you have someone who's had a midline surgical site and then you have a midline mass, a hernia is obviously high up on your differential. Um, a KUB does show you some good information in terms of if there's distended loops of small bowel versus a non-obstructive pattern. Um, but most of those patients probably will end up with a CT scan to really delineate the anatomy of that hernia. Uh, so in this case, you know, let's say a slight white count 11, just over our, I think our Loyola marker is like 10.5 is normal. So just over that, but pretty normal BMP, uh, BMP CT scan here, you can see he has an incarcerated ventral hernia. Um, for CT scans, kind of the more uh, contrast, the different colors we can get the better picture. So here we have PO contrast, um, IV contrast is also helpful. Um, obviously, if they have a huge AKI, they're not in renal failure before, sometimes that'll limit the decision to give IV contrast, but especially for concerns for obstruction and intestinal pathology, PO contrast can really uh, kind of add another shade of gray to an otherwise black and white picture. So here you can see some slightly distended loops of bowel coming into the hernia sac here, and then here on this exit, you know, a lot more compressed uh, so it seems like he has an incarcerated ventral hernia. What do we want to do now?
Sorry? Yeah, I agree. Um, so, you know, in this case, I think this is another patient that um, who has a big lump there, you know, in general, you're really not going to hurt anything by pushing on it, uh, seeing if it'll reduce. Um, sometimes you can pop it in before we can get down there. It makes them feel a lot better. Uh, they don't necessarily have to wait for someone else. Usually if they're really incarcerated, the bowel is like really dead, you won't be able to get it in. They will be screaming at you. Um, but for some of them that are just popped out briefly, uh, has a little kink in it, you can just push those back in real quick and they'll feel a lot better um, while we come down and see them a little bit in a little bit. NG tubes also great. You know, a lot of times they'll need an NG tube before they can even get the CT. They'll come in throwing up a huge gastric bubble when you get your KUB. Um, 61 year old guy, you don't want him aspirating, ending up with a pneumonia on top of all of this. Uh, so I'm a big believer in early NG tube. Um, I think most people kind of get one shot. You can throw up once, that's okay. But if you throw up again, you know, I don't want you aspirating. So we'll probably put an NG tube in. Uh, you know, and then surgery to evaluate because it is kind of a physical problem. It tends to be a physical solution. In terms of kind of like we were talking about for bowel obstruction, there's kind of three areas that we think about. Um, so that can be either adhesions. So in this guy who's had prior abdominal surgery, um, definitely kind of the most common. Once you've entered the peritoneal cavity, you forever, the rest of your life, have a risk of forming scars, getting a small bowel obstruction. Uh, hernias. So people who have hernias always have that spot in their fascia where bowel and stuff can get in and kink off. Then you always have to think about cancer, um, especially in young patients, intussusception can be pretty benign, but in older patients, um, intussusception is highly suspicious for cancer. And that is it. Uh, thank you for your time and patience. Um, any questions, concerns? Was everything just totally wrong? <laughs> I'll wait an awkward amount of silence and then proceed. All right, thanks guys. Oh, appreciate it. Just, just the right amount of...